And hello, everyone, and welcome back to Cyrus Webb Presents here on Amazon Live. I'm your host, Cyrus Webb. Glad you all could join us once again. Also want to welcome those tuning in on Facebook and Twitter today. Glad you all could join us once again. I'm so excited about today's guest. He's making his first appearance here on Cyrus Webb Presents. We're excited to be speaking with David Moscow. You guys know him, of course, as an actor, producer, director, but also the host of a very popular show called From Scratch. Well, as of this month, he's also the author of a book by the same name. You guys can see it there. From Scratch, the book is coming out officially next week. We're excited to be able to speak with, with David, not only about the journey of writing the book, but also the experiences that he was able to have, that he chronicles, and what he was able to learn about the world around him and even about himself. If you guys have not pre-ordered the book, we're going to remind you how you can do that. But David, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure to be here. My pleasure to be here. I love that countdown. That got me hyped. <laughs> Your countdown is great. I appreciate 89, that. 88, it's like this big, powerful music. I was like, I'm ready for this. <laughs> Look, I appreciate that. David, this is, um, I told you before we went, went live here, I when I first heard about the book, I was excited about it because having watched the show, I, I was excited about how this all kind of came about. We've gotten to know you because of your creativity, as I mentioned, as an actor, producer, director. But I feel like through From Scratch, the show, and now through the book, we get to know about David's curiosity. So I want to ask you that question. What has that been like for you to share your curiosity about the world with now all of us? Oh, wow. What a, what a great sort of, you teased out sort of the, the heart of the book in a way. Mm -hmm. I think with all things creative, you know, with, with acting, with writing, with directing and producing, your your problem solving, and and at the heart of this, um, that's what was going on in the book. We would give ourselves missions where I would I would meet with a, a chef, and they would make me a meal, and then I would have to figure out how each ingredient was made in that meal, and then go out and get it myself. So problems, right? And um, and I think. Curiosity is it, curiosity about people, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing that pushes you as an actor, you know, teasing out the personalities uh, of your characters um, also kind of lends itself to exploring, in this case, food production, right? Like um, I, I grew up in the Bronx and, and spend a lot of my childhood going back and forth between Hollywood and, and, and New York because I was a child actor. I was in the movie Big with Tom Hanks and, um, and that kind of, so, but I had cousins in Utah and Montana and, and, um, and as, a, as a child, we would go apple picking and, and my cousins would go fishing and they lived this sort of like, for me, an exotic life. I looked at that and was like, wow, that's so different than this city kid that I, I grew up with. And so, so I always looked at that in awe almost, particularly my grandpa was like, I remember, you know, we weren't a very well-to-do family. And so he would go out and get a deer and, and then they would send out pieces of it and everyone put it in their freezer. Mm. And that was like steak over the winter time. Yeah. And I was just like, my goodness, what a, like he can feed himself, he can feed it, the family. And, and I always thought that was neat. And I had no idea how to do that. Um, so it was an itch that I'd always kind of wanted to scratch, like um, particularly as you grow up, you, you don't go apple picking as much. You don't go fishing as much. You've got, you know, the world, the world just takes over and yeah. your free time kind of disappears a little bit. Um, but I had a son, my first kid, and I, and I was thinking back about like, oh, well, what did I enjoy when I was a kid? And it was all this kind of stuff. And, um, and so that was, why I put my foot in there, like to try and um, can somebody who doesn't know what they're doing make a meal for themselves? Yeah. Um, and then, and I thought it was going to be just sort of like this adventure, which it is. There's a lot of sort of adventurous stuff in there. Right. Um, but you start to, you come across things that you're like, wait, what is that? Why we're in the South China Sea trying to get fish to make a fish sauce in the Philippines, patisse, which is like this foundational ingredient to Philippine cuisine, and we can't catch any fish. And then I asked the fisherman, like, oh, is this normal? And he's like, oh, yeah. It wasn't normal for my dad or my grand or my grandpa, but for me, we go out sometimes and we don't get anything. So then we're like, wait a minute, your whole livelihood, I mean, the Philippine 
cuisine is based on rice and fish. Uh, so, so this whole country's cuisine is based on uh, a, a food, a food source that is having serious problems. So then, you know, on the show, we kind of left it at that. Like, oh, we struggled to get the fish. But in the book, we're able to deep dive and, and try and figure out, like, well, what is actually going on? Um, yeah. Was it just that night? Or is this a serious, a serious problem? Um, exactly. Exactly. And, and David, I think that's the thing that, hello to you, Dr. Claire, I see you over there on the Facebook side. I think that's the interesting thing about this book, too, because I think one thing I love that you, you've done in from, in from scratch, for those who haven't seen the show, I think the book actually may be a great introduction for you even to that, because you're almost, you know, we, we've all heard the saying, David, or at least here in the South, we say it, you know, you, you know, you open up the hood to see how things work, right? Um, and, and, for you, that's what it seems like you did, not only in this country, but around the world. So it kind of goes back to the curiosity thing for me, because it takes, I mean, I feel like, and I'm curious as to your thoughts about this, it almost, you seem to be in a sense where you're you're actively wanting to learn. Some people want to get to a place where they feel like they know. You seem to be in a place where you always want to be learning. Is that just a part of who you are? Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm always sort of humanity is interesting. The world is interesting. Discovering new things is always uh, like I take it as like an incredible um, running across something that I don't know that I've never learned before or heard of before. Um, I think is exciting. And I also think that um, I think that expertise is something that is amazing and and I think in the world today, a lot of, you know, everyone thinks they're an, an expert, especially on the internet, right? But coming across real experts who can actually teach me who, I don't know what I'm doing, right? So I actually right. need them. And it's a very, um, it's a humbling experience to have to, to be beholden to somebody, to be dependent on somebody, um, to learn things that I don't know, but I'm also excited to come out on the other side of that with having possibly learned, figured out how to do something, how to harvest wheat with a, you know, using tools from 500 years ago in Italy, right? Like, how do you go on an elk hunt? And what do I feel about an elk hunt, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that comes up a lot with food is Initially, like, you know, I go to the grocery store, I get my meat wrapped in plastic, I go to a restaurant, it's served on a plate. There's a real distance between me and the food that I was consuming. And to the point where it was like unconscious consumption, you drive up to the, to the uh, fast food um, drive through and they give you something in paper and you eat it in the car. And, and there was no thought about the animals that I was eating, where this food came from, the people who were making this food. And were they well paid? Are they, you know, um, yeah. so there's all this stuff tied up in food consumption. Uh, the environment, are we destroying the environment with some of these practices? And, and, and you, what I came to realize, I mean, I was out doing field work for five years, like on the ground daily. And what you realize is that food produ food producers are at the forefront. They are the front line of climate change, of economic justice, of environmental problems, um, and uh, and it really causes you to I mean, you look at your meals completely differently. And I yeah. hope that's when someone reads the book, they'll start to see that. They'll start to tease out, like, oh, okay, conscious consumption is is necessary. Um, and you know, a lot of the stories are really fun and adventurous, but there's some sort of, there's dark threads. Like once you start pulling these threads, it goes down to this place and you're like, will humanity exist? Right? Like mm -hmm. if we run out of fish, um, what does that mean to us? Right? What does that mean? There, there's a, just to go back to that Philippines chapter. So the South China Sea has lost 70% of its fish in the last 20 years. And there are massive territorial disputes going on in the South China Sea. You know, 
theoretically over sort of ocean territory, but it really is about fish. China's building islands to extend the Chinese territory so they can have that fish. But the fish is going to disappear. So unless people can reach across the ocean and say, I know you think this is your land and I think this is mine, but if we don't solve this fish issue, there's going to be nothing for anybody. Um, so that's something, you know, that was unbelievable. And then at the same time, you, you find places that are doing incredible things, you know, Costa Rica, Iceland, Finland. We talk about this in the, in the book. Um, things that America can learn from, that the world can learn from, um, you know, be humble, see when people are doing things better than you and figure out like, oh, okay, I'll follow them. You know, they know what they're doing. So, yeah. David, you bring up something. I actually want to read, if you don't mind, from the book. As you were talking, it, it came to me, um, I, a note I had made. And it's in the chapter. And again, for those who are just coming in, again, I welcome you guys on the Amazon side. We have the book highlighted in the carousel on the Amazon side. You guys can go ahead and pre-order it now for yourself. It officially comes out on the 25th. Uh, but you can go ahead and pre-order it, so it'll be there for you. Uh, again, everyone, David Moscow is our guest. We're talking with him not only about his journey, but also about the brand new book and, of course, the show by the same name from scratch. You guys see it there. And, and in the book, as David is going from chapter to chapter, he's really going not only across this country, but around the world. And I want to read something you said in the chapter of, about Texas and Wyoming, uh, David, because it ties in the point you were just making about not thinking about what we're consuming and not really having that relationship with the food and thinking about the people preparing it and everything. You talked about someone named Gina, which I want to get to Gina, because Gina had something interesting to say in that chapter. But you wrote this when it comes to yourself and your team. Um, when it came to um, to this particular chapter, you said, if hunting is an integral part of different subcultures, some subcultures feel much more comfortable to me than others. Hunting is killing. And just as people kill people for many different reasons, whether on battlefields or on neighborhood streets, they kill animals for many reasons and with many emotions. I don't think hunting can be thought of as a thing in itself, but only in the context in which it's embedded. I saw you discussing this in an interview about the show, but I want to talk to you about that and what Gina said about the connection between those who hunt and what they eat. What was that like for you to kind of have that that thought and that conversation with yourself about that? Well, <clears throat> uh, killing animals and eating meat was one of the larger sort of conversations I was having. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it was it, the first time I, I went on a wild boar hunt in, and I talk about it in this episode, it was, uh, in this chapter, um, it was, uh, really emotional and, and, a, a sort of a horrible experience. And, um, and yet hypocritically, I was still eating meat. And so I had to try and figure out like, okay, well, what's going on here? And I, I realized I, I live, my community, my family, my community, larger community are meat eaters. And that taking the leap to sort of vegetarianism or veganism was something that I, I wasn't ready for because it really meant separating myself from my close family, my, you know, uh, my my wife's family, my my parents, because um, we sit around and we you know we eat steak and we eat adobo and chicken and and so I actually think that sort of vegetarians and vegans, as much as they're teased, are extremely brave people because they are taking that um, they're really living uh, their ethos. Um, and, and, and the, the separation between them and the community is huge. You know, they, they have to show up at dinners and say, I'm not going to eat this. You have to cook something different for me. And that's a big deal. Right. Um, and so fight, like fighting with myself about sort of like, how could I, how can I ethically eat meat? Um, because it's not necessarily about sort of killing the animal for me personally, it was 
it was not enjoyable and I understand why people have removed themselves and that like, you know, you used to go when my mom was young, you would go to butcher shops and there'd be live chickens or you'd see the animal hanging. And now we really only get it wrapped in plastic. It's like, yeah. we have separated ourselves from this. Um, but you know, sort of humans eat animals and we have for th tens of thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. So that's not really, what was upsetting to me what i think is the problem is sort of the inhumanity that how can we humanely raise these animals so that they're not living in this hellish existence before we kill them and then and then the people who are um who are raising them and and, and producing the food need to be paid um well for this so yeah. those are the two things that i sort of came away from in that chapter and i was actually wrestling with is is hunting more ethical in a way than you know eating uh meat that's raised in sort of agribusiness large feedlots and stuff because in that sense those animals live in a terrible existence until you know we put them out of their misery and in the wild they're living free until you know and then they don't really know at, at that point um that's the end um right. so i feel like one of the things I learned from the hunting uh, is that, and and sort of generally eating meat throughout the, the book, is that I want to buy meat that is raised humanely and that the workers are paid well. Um, and so that affects my pocketbook um, or my wallet. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and, and that's a good thing um, because it means I'm gonna eat less of it, which is Ooh. probably good for my health and probably generally good for the world. Um, and so I think if, if people, you know, read the book, if one of the things that they came away with was that, oh, okay, I'm going to move meat, not from the center of my plate, but maybe to an appetizer or a condiment, or, you know, let's do it once a week. My mom growing up, again, we weren't well to do. She would have meat once a week or once a month. Um, and it was a big deal. It was important. And now sort of, we feel like we can consume it whenever. Um, and then personally, if you have it less, when you do have it, it's a special thing. It's great. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. was that, did that answer your question? In a yeah, it, it did. It did. And I just wanted to piggyback off of that, David, with what Gina says in that, in that particular chapter after you, after the passage I read, and that was two things that struck me that made me think I am a meat eater myself. And, one thing she did think about that did make me make me kind of it gives you some it gives you food for thought. Not only the the idea of the hunting slash killing, but also the environmental impact. I think a lot of times we don't put the two together, the environmental impact of our actions. And I think that really is a thread for me, David, in going throughout the book, whether you're talking about there's another I think it was in Kenya. I think it was where you mentioned about there was a saying, if you see three trees together, that's a forest. I think that was Kenya. That's Iceland. Uh, Iceland. Okay. Iceland, and, yeah. But I mean, it just kind of really goes together about the impact that we're having on the world around us um, outside of even what we consume. What was that like for you to think about with what Gina had to say about the impact, not just on the hunting, but the impact that we as humans, again, as we see throughout your book, are having on the world around us? Well, I traveled during the uh, while we were doing the um, the research, uh, Gina is a vegetarian, sometimes pescatarian, and then we had a vegan with us. And so we were always, um, they were certainly pushing me sort of morally, like, why are you doing this? What is the reason, you know, behind the exploration? And initially I just was doing it so, you know, I could eat good food and learn how to <laughs> this stuff happen. Um, right. But then, you know, a, a, a sort of a worldview started to crystallize. Mm. Um, and so the book was initially going to be about sort of human community and how food ties people together. And that even like Americans like to think, oh, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I just did it alone. I'm on an island. But it takes 60 people to make a slice of pizza. So you're really not, you'll never be right. And yeah. we're all connected to one another. So that was like the first thing that I wanted the book to be about. And then 
as we went out, we were confronted by the environmental impact. And it was huge. Like every, aside from the, the overfishing that's going on in the, in the South China Sea, I mean, in South Africa, there, there were seven years of drought followed by seven years of um, uh, no rain or sorry, floods. And these farmers were, farms were uh, uh, selling left and right because they just couldn't produce the food. Um, and, and while we were there, I think Cape Town was about to lose its water. They were going to run out of water while we were shooting. And this is one of the major cities on the planet was going to not have water. And it's totally tied in, like, either it's some of the problems are caused by the way we produce food or food production is going to be affected. Like, how are they going to grow food in the Cape where that's one of the bread baskets of, of South Africa? Um, so every place we went, you, you cannot get away from it. You cannot deny it. Um, it, it, I went to, I went to, uh, I went spear fishing for octopus in Sardinia, um, and we couldn't find any. And, you know, so then we had to change, um, and we decided, okay, we're not going to do octopus. There's this sea anemone that lives in these coves. I'll go get that. And, and then I almost drowned. <laughs> so yeah. it was, so it's almost like how, you know, people are talking about, we're going to eat crickets now. Right. And they're going to make cricket sandwiches. And you're like, well, why? Let's, let's, let's unpack this. Why are we suddenly looking at having to eat crickets? Well, because we're not managing, we're mismanaging sort of we're, as our stewardship on the planet, right? We're mismanaging this and we are not, um, we're over consuming. There's no sort of like, you know, wait a minute, no one's taking a breath. Our leaders are, you know, pedal to the metal. And it, it's not like we don't have the knowledge. Like this stuff is out there. There are people, there are scientists, um, the, the farmers themselves know, and we can fix this if we take the time and, 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 and care. Right. Um, and one of the things that, uh, and I say we can fix this because we saw it. So the Philippines, the South China Sea is being overfished. Well, the Philippines just started building marine protected areas. And the reason, so that's an area where people aren't allowed to fish in that area. And the fish stocks come back and they come back so much that it overflows outside of the marine protected area. And now people can fish those outside areas, right? And the reason they're doing that is because the EU passed a law the EU citizens voted and they said, we would only like to purchase sustainably caught fish and the Philippines would like to sell to the EU. So they demanded, the EU was demanding that, you know, they're going to get sustainably raised fish, which means that the Philippines now has to build MPAs, which is phenomenal. Um, and, and that's because people care. And so again, conscious eating is a way that we can really affect change. Um, and you also eat better. Like, yeah. you get better meals yeah. <laughs> at the end of it. Like, and and it seemed like what you and you share that you show that in the book. No matter where you are, David. The other thing I wanted our audience to know that I thought was really fascinating about this book. You know, I've never been outside the United States myself personally, but one thing I thought was so interesting: no matter where you were, the way people work together. The way that they were, as you mentioned about the pizza, about, you know, everyone realizing they could have a part in this. And then I thought about, again, the title, you know, of the show and of the book from scratch. And I think a lot of times it is it does start with us kind of rethinking the way we look at ourselves, looking at the world and looking at our relationship with others. Is that what you've also seen, David, from the show? And now what you hope comes from the book, people understanding that no matter where we live, that the things that do connect us that also are key for our survival. Oh yeah. I mean, you said it, you said it, right? Like unless we um, reconnect with community. And I mean that in a way where like, we really respect all the people that are, that are in our community. And 
food producers are the perfect example of, I used to, I used to, you know, people used to talk about, you know, who in this world deserves to be paid more and everyone would say teachers, right. And nurses and, and, and the people who bring our food to our table, whether it's in the fields or in the restaurants yeah. are those people as well. And instead we kind of do the opposite. I mean, migrant workers are forced out of the country with political wins. It's just like, and these are the people who are feeding us the most important sustenance. Um, and it just seems, it seems stupid. It seems, it seems stupid. Like aside from sort of moral, how you're supposed to treat your friends and neighbors, it's stupid for our own health of our community. Um, here are people who are hard, extremely hard workers willing to do jobs that not a lot of Americans want to do at this point. And um, so, so that's something that's, that, that, you know, the, the connection that we ignore between all of ourselves and food, whether you're sitting across the table from somebody or working in a field next to somebody or fishing with somebody that immediately ties, you know, you know, binds you, your humanity to one another. Um, there's nothing like, you know, praying for fish and pulling up a net or going out, um, on a mushroom hunt, uh, and, and, you know, and there uh, you really have to listen to your guide because that expert's super important. You do not want to grab the wrong mushroom and bring that thing home or it's yeah. the last mushroom you'll ever try. Um, and so, so going out on a hike, mushrooming with someone who knows what they're doing um, is a beautiful thing. Uh, Travis, who's, we went, I've been mushrooming a bunch. We did in Croatia. I talk about um, Finland and the Pacific Northwest in the book. And Travis is a, a, what does he call himself? A shroomer or something. Oh, I forget. He's going to yell at me. But um, he, uh, he says something, he said something really interesting, which struck me where most people, especially in the Pacific Northwest, it gets really gray in the fall when winter starts coming in and people get depressed. And, and he's like, I get excited because mm. mushrooms are coming. And so he goes out into the rain in the fall and the winter and harvest mushrooms. And what a, what an amazing perspective. And that's when we went with him, you know, dreary, dreary Seattle, you know, winter or early winter. And, uh, and we were excited. We harvested a ton. Well, David, there's so much that I think people have learned about the world around us through the show from scratch. And I definitely think that will continue with some great conversations with the book. That's why, again, we want them to be able to get it here on Amazon. You guys can go ahead and pre-order it now. It officially comes out October 25th, uh, just as we're saying goodbye to National Book Month. It's a great way to end the month with a new book. Again, David Moscow has been our guest. Again, you guys can see the book there. Definitely make sure you guys pick it up. David, I have really enjoyed this conversation with you. And I, and I really want to say thank you for, I mean, for putting yourself out there. Because, I mean, for those who don't know, this whole show would not even happen if it was not for you. I mean, you created this along with your father, being able to have your father involved with it as well. Um, I love being able to see uh, him with the book, to see you uh, being able to have your book and to share that story on Instagram. I saw that when I was prepping for this segment with you today. And, and I think the hard work, I think, is so important. But I think it also shows in this book that the hard work continues. And it continues now with each one of us who watch the show and to read the book. So we thank you for, for giving us the assignment. Oh, thank you, Cyrus, man. This was a wonderful interview. And um, yeah, it, it, it has been a blessing to work with my dad on the book, to be able to have an excuse to uh, call him up every day and, and <laughs> speak for hours has been wonderful. And um, yeah, I hope that, you know, the research and the learning, uh, the teachings that all these experts gave me along the way on this journey that, you know, I can pass that along and that it's valuable. Yeah. Well, it definitely will be. Again, everyone, you guys can see it there from scratch. Again, by David Moscow and his dad as well, John Moscow as well. Make sure you guys do pick it up. Also get it for your friends. And David, it goes without saying, you're welcome back here anytime, man. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank you. All right. And we thank you, our viewers, for tuning in to another great segment of Cyrus Web Presents. Until next time, you all make it a great one. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.